So the whole debate around data is going to start off and be a theme of the whole day. This particular session is very much about the practicals of what you could physically do and what other people have done and a little bit of uh, sharing of experiences in that way. So we'll, we'll get started now. I'll ask uh, each of the speakers just to introduce themselves before they uh, show you their presentations. The presentations will be about 15 minutes each. And then at the end, the panel's available for you to ask questions of uh, on any of the subjects or indeed other subjects that come up during the morning. So without further ado, Will. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm William Perrin. I'm rather loud, if anybody's controlling the level, but they're not. Um, so I'll just keep on shouting, and you might be deaf by the time we finished. Um, I have a strange background uh, in open data in that I was very heavily involved in the early central government efforts to start freeing up data um, about three or four years ago. I commissioned a piece of work uh, known as the Power of Information. I commissioned Tom Steinberg and Ed Mayo to, to produce that and then drove that work package through central government until it became the Ta Power of Information Task Force. And I'll um, explain a little bit about what that did later. Um, but was very much involved at the heart of government uh, with a long track record in getting things done inside very large bureaucracies and watching attempts from the outside to change bureaucracies succeed and fail. And that's what I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, I also, and I now run a business uh, called Talk About Local that helps people create hyperlocal websites around the country. And if any of you are interested later this morning or at lunchtime and getting together for a chat and a catch up on the latest on, on the hyperlocal scene, I'll be around and uh, I want to arrange you to meet uh, two or three people here. So um, I'm going to run through at a very high level um, and in a not entirely detailed and serious way some approaches you can use to get information out of large bureaucracies, to free up the data. And then um, other, other presenters will talk about their approaches um, within a kind of almost a framework I'll set out. So this is the first method you can use to try and get data out of large public administrations, the bulldozer method. Um, you can try and confront the public administration with something so large, so, um, so outrageous, that they simply don't have any choice but to cough up the data or to cooperate or work with you. It requires a lot of brute force, an enormous amount of power, um, and can be very, very effective. But it requires enormous amounts of energy to get things done. Here's an example from Birmingham. And you'll notice uh, throughout this presentation, I keep coming back to examples from Birmingham, and I'll explain why at the end. This was a, a brute force assault by a bunch of uh, coders, essentially, in Birmingham on the Birmingham City Council website. They were so pissed off that the website had cost about 2.8 million pounds to redesign and relaunch. Uh, it was a very bad website, a very, very poor corporate website for Birmingham City Council. A bunch of volunteers got together, ripped all the information out of the Birmingham City Council website, and reassembled it into this thing, BCC DIY, Birmingham City Council Do It Yourself. Now, this is an extraordinary piece of work. Um, they created a fully functioning council website in about uh, 10 days and refined it over the following 10 or 20 days um, using dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of hours of volunteer time from very highly skilled volunteer amateur coders. Not amateur coders, professional coders who had a sense of civic good. They thought Birmingham could do better than the website they, they rejected that the council produced, so they just produced their own one. And for a while, you could actually pay your council tax through the BCC DIY website because they found that the Capita website was so badly coded they could just rip the payments module out and represent it in their site. So an extraordinary piece of work and actually world class. I haven't, in my perspective in the cabinet office, I used to look globally at what, the, what, you know, what people are doing all over the world. I've not seen anybody else in the world do anything like this. It's an extraordinary way in which you can use open data. So a brute force assault, huge amounts of effort producing a remarkable product that really challenges the council to think again. And indeed, all across central government and local government challenges people to think again about how you can do corporate websites. You need to take care, though, that you are actually using a bulldozer. Um, a lot of people on the web, um, web campaigners, uh, often, I find, have one of those Douglas Adams style, style scale errors where they think that something they're doing is very important because uh, it's out there on Twitter. Everybody's tweeting about it. It must be important. Well, bureaucracies just ignore that. You, know, you have to be very careful to judge. You have to make great care to judge that what you're doing is important enough uh, that people will actually notice in the bureaucracy, that there's enough effort, there's enough power behind it. Um, and James is going to be talking a bit about rewired state later, which is an interesting example that started off very, very small but became actually quite powerful and became something a little bit more bulldozer-like, maybe. You may think, though, it's a lot of garden tractors. I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Um, here's another method, the ferret method. This is the ferret method of getting data out of, out of a big bureaucracy. 
When I was working on the Power of Information Task Force with uh, Tom Loosemore, um, who's now head of 4IP, but led all the Web2 effort at the BBC, and Richard Allen, the former MP, Lib Dem MP, now head of P global public affairs at Facebook, um, they, just, they came up with this. They would send me as a civil servant and Richard Sterling, uh, who worked for me, um, out in, into government, say, go and get that data set. And Tom wrote this up as a, as you see here, as a crack team of data ferrets have been dispatched into government. And that was kind of how it felt. We'd be shoved down a pipe and basically told not to come back until we got this data set off a bunch of hapless officials that weren't <coughs> expecting us, um, let's say, in the Department of Education. Um, this can work very, very well if you find a big bureaucracy that is quite resistant to change. You find some people inside the organization who are willing to work with you um, or who might be sponsored in a bureaucratic sense by a senior, office, a senior officer or a senior official, and you deploy them to fetch specific targets within the organization that you identify. Um, and it's often, I was working in the cabinet office, which in the government has a, has, a, has a strange status, quite close to the prime minister's office. It gave us added leverage to actually go out and get stuff. If we turned up in a remote uh, DWP office or, or, a, or a, uh, um, a Department for Education or Children and Families, or whatever it's called, office, and said, we want that data, people go, oh my God, these people are here from the cabinet office. They want this thing. Perhaps we should give it to them. Um, it's quite simple psychology. Uh, we didn't have to bite too many people either. Um, this is an example of something that came out of a data ferreting exercise. Um, the story here was that a, an official, we were talking to Downing Street, there was an official in Downing Street who was a keen cyclist, and he said, well, what have you got on cycle data? You know, what can, come on in, come, come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in. It is quite hard to find this room. Come on in, take a seat. Welcome. Um, I was just running through, I'm William Perry, and I was just running through a series of uh, methods in which you can get, uh, methods of which you can get data in large public bureaucracies. So oh. this is an example of uh, an official in Downing Street who was very interested in cycling data. Um, we were talking to him um, from the Power of Information team about, well, could we get some more cycling data? So we used his authority to go off to the Department for Transport and get out of them the data about cycling deaths and cycling accidents and serious injuries from cycling. The kind of data set that you would think ought to be published, and the statistics are published. They publish it in a nice table every year. They publish the statistics, but they weren't publishing the data with the geocoded references on it. So we got this data out, um, and it came out eventually in um, spring 2009, and very quickly, people were lashing it up into maps like this. So, you know, this is really very, very good, and it's, um, I think... At the bottom, you can just see here, in Richmond Park, London, there were eight serious accidents all around the main entrances to Richmond Park. Now, that gives you some really good granular information. If you're a local cycling activist, it shows you where you can start a campaign. It gives you some evidence to actually get things changed and start a campaign. So the ferret method can produce spot data sets, not, not necessarily wholesale releases. For wholesale releases, you need something a bit more like an avalanche. You need something that really is quite, uh, quite brutal, very forceful, and all-encompassing. Um, and here's, here's an example of this. Um, this was, uh, again, from Birmingham. This is uh, a, really a wonderful FOI-led campaign to get parking data, parking fine data out of the city council and the, or the transport body that works for the city council. Um, and the guy who put in a, se a whole series of very detailed, sort of really quite anally retentive FOI requests of asking for very precise data from lots of different bodies, he was an operational researcher in his day job. He's very, very good at stats and was able to produce a, a, an extraordinary statistical analysis of um, where the most ticketed streets in Birmingham were. Um, and also, which parking agents, or traffic wardens as we used to call them, were giving out the most tickets. And it found some really quite extraordinary behavior by some traffic wardens who were ticketing at three times the rate of everybody else. Um, and this came from a barrage of FOI requests. And if you want to, you have a very, very simple way of doing this. You know, this is your snow machine. Is, uh, is what do they know? Very, very simple way of putting in large numbers of FOI requests. And the joy of it, for an open data perspective, is that those requests then come out with a static URL and they're on the web. So you can start to reference them somewhere, and you may be, I don't know if this works, because we'll hear a bit about CCAN later, it may be that you could, come on in, come on in, please, come on in, very welcome. Sneak through. Um, it may be then that you can start to build, if you put in enough FOI requests, and remember, FOI legislation is well understood, the data that you're asking for, all the confidentiality arguments and commercial confidentiality have already been had and been won, and the, all the resources are out there. If you go and look at uh, some of the, the websites that explain how to put in good FOI requests, the arguments have already been won. All you have to do is keep putting in the requests. 
So if I was sitting here in Manchester today, where, as far as I can make out, the City Council has not coughed up a lot of data, I would, by this afternoon, put in 100, 200 FOI requests, all targeted at specific data sets that you know the Council has, that you see other Councils have released, it, released, and within three months, you will start to get some of that data back. And you'll start to build, then, a public data store, uh, your public data, a simple public data store about FOI requests for data for Manchester City Council. It's very easy to do. It's half a day's work. Um, and it's, that's where I would start. Um, to actually build my own little avalanche. Then you've got the um, extraterrestrial method, um, which is actually doing the classic public service thing, which is going in at a leadership level. So you can't get any public service bureaucracy to change at a wholesale level unless you get leadership back up one way or another. And that's leadership both from the political leadership, which in many councils in Britain has changed very recently. Um, it's about bureaucratic leadership, so it's the... Um, whatever used to, the town clerk used to be called, the chief executive in modern parlance, the top officer, um, or someone around them. And it's also some budgetary leadership, usually some budgetary or legal um, incentives. So a leadership strike can be a very, very effective way of getting a large bureaucracy to change. And we had that at an epic level in Britain when Tim Berners-Lee got to a lunch at Chequers with the Prime Minister. They had lunch with about 20, 30 people. Berners-Lee and, and Gordon, sorry, the former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, basically got hit it off like a house on fire because essentially they're both geeks, but geeks of a different sort. Um, and uh, Berners -Lee, Berners -Lee, the Prime Minister said to Berners-Lee, well, what can I do to advance the, um, you know, the use of the internet in Britain? Berners-Lee said, you should just put all your data on the internet and give it away. And Brown said, okay, then let's do that. And then 24 hours later, Andrew Stott and Richard Sterling, the civil service team in the cabinet office, got this massive boost of political leadership and Tim Berners-Lee coming on board to actually effect change. Now, that's not going to happen necessarily every council, but the government that's just been elected, we think, that the, if the Conservative proposals on uh, openness and open data and transparency are carried through, we should see a massive change in the political, political direction being given to councils across the country uh, to, to open up their data, and hopefully they'll continue. Uh, the work's already been started. Now, Berners-Lee is, is... I mean, this is a hideously dull side. I mean, look at it. It's just not very appealing. Um, but what, what's on this side is very, very important. This is Tim Berners-Lee's epic article written in plain English that even I can understand. I'm not a technical person at all on putting government data online. It just does what it says at the top. This is a classic Berners-Lee web consortium article. And he says, I can almost, you know, you can almost read this out. There are two philosophies to putting data on the web. The top-down one, you get a plan, you get committees, blah, 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 blah. This, in fact, takes so long, it is often never finished. And anyway, does not, in fact, get corporate or national consensus in the end. So you can start that, but it's never going to deliver a result. Never going to deliver a result. The other method experience recommends is to do it bottom up. A top level mandate is extremely valuable, but grassroots action is essential. Put the data up where it is, join it together later. And in fact, what one needs really is a blend of all these approaches. No one approach I've outlined works. There's no magic bullet here, there's no silver bullet. You have to use all these approaches. Some of the things that other, other colleagues on the panel will talk about now. Um, but that's really the only way to get things done. Now, one of the things that Berners-Lee says in this article is you shouldn't faff about, if you are a public authority, waiting until you've got your data in a perfect form before you release it. You know, coming up with a, um, a big, you know, big API or, you know, lots of RSS feeds and all the rest of it. You shouldn't do that. Don't start there. Start by putting up database dumps. Start by putting up CSV files, the most crude, simple form of data you can find, and stick it on a web server. Now, the cost of doing that is nil. It's literally nil. Every local authority runs a website. Everyone has data that can be output into, of different forms that can be output into a CSV file. That's normally how the presentational part of the analysis is done. Take that CSV file and using the magic of click and drag, put it on a web server and just publish it. Under, so council.gov.uk slash open data. Just go and publish it. Um, and that's very much the easiest way of doing it. There's no excuse if you are a public body. There is no excuse whatsoever for not just starting that way. There are no cost implications. If it's, not pub if it's not personal data, there are no privacy implications. It's the right thing to do. And here in Manchester, oh, sorry, that's one thing you should never do. So if you're on the other side, if you're not a public authority, never, ever, ever sit around waiting. Never do that. It just doesn't work. The public bodies will not change. I was a bureaucrat for 15 years. I'm fucking good at waiting. You know, that's what I do. You wait, you wait, you wait, you wait. Um, and you can outwait anybody. People will die uh, while you're waiting to do things. So never do that. Never sit around and say, oh, well, we're, we're talking to them. They're all perfectly reasonable. We're waiting for funding. We're getting a plan. That won't work. 
you've got to start. You've got to start doing simple, subversive things that start to present that data. You've got to start building alliances with people inside the organization, and you have to start a momentum. Sitting around and waiting doesn't get you anywhere. So in Manchester, then you've got a choice. I've asked around a bit, I've asked around a bit, and all the examples I've used today have been from Birmingham. So I'm coming to Manchester and saying, basically, Birmingham's doing a lot better than you are in every way, as far as I can make out. Now, I'm very happy to sort of eat, you know, eat my words if someone can show me loads and loads of good, world-class public data things being done in Manchester, but I can't see them, and I've asked around a bit, and no one can point, them to, point me to them on a large scale. There may be stuff there, but I can't see it on the web. So what I'd like to do is, I'm a, I'm a member of a thing called the Local Public Data Panel uh, that works for communities and local government, or whatever it's, whatever it's going to be called, uh, to help councils free up data. And I'd love to do a bit of work with Manchester to actually help you catch up with Birmingham at least in a visible public way, so that people understand more what's going on here. Because at the moment, you've got a choice. You, know, you can either keep keep out sign up, or you can put the welcome mat out. And I think in a big, modern, open, global city, you need to have an open, global, modern approach to data. The two things go hand in hand now. You can see it happening in America under Obama. You can see it starting to happen in Birmingham. We can, we'll hear Emma talking about it in London in a minute. That's the challenge for Manchester. So I'm happy to take questions, I think, after the panel session. And I'll be around until just after lunch today. and happy to have a chat with anybody. Thank you. I don't know if a few things to take away from that. Obviously, lots of fighting taught there, um, particularly with regard to Birmingham. I'm, I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of people in the room who want to see this happen in Manchester. And that's part of the point of today, is to sort of kickstart that debate in the city and see how many people are interested in doing it, what they're interested in doing, and whether there's room to take that forward at some other sort of platform. Hello. Um, so yes, I, 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 I am a developer. I don't work inside government. I never want to work inside government. Um, it doesn't interest me at all. Um, but I do like making things. I do like playing around with things and, you know, creating stuff. Um, so I wanted to do that with government data and then I realized there wasn't a lot of it. Um, and as soon as I have my slides, I'll be able to say how I got into government stuff at all. Um, I guess I better start. Um, so, there was this thing called Barcamp UK GovWeb, fantastically named, um, which was using the Barcamp model, unconference, brilliant. Um, I like Barcamps. Um, found out about this, thought that was a good idea. Um, went along to it. A lot of fun was there. You know, it made connections between lots of civil servants. You could see that there was something magic going on there. Um, and I got involved in that quite a bit. Um, came up to the next year and uh, I was perhaps going to be involved in helping organize it. And I was just like, well, this, this sounds good. But the problem with last year was that nothing was actually made. Um, so what we needed um, was more hackers. Um, more hackers to, to make things. I don't know if you all know the term hacker in its real sense, which is just pe people who make things, not necessarily cracking stuff, but just bodging stuff together. Men in their sheds, women in their sheds, you know, just um, making things. Um, I remember where I'm up to in my slides. Um, so we needed we needed more hackers. Um, so I was I was going to, I wanted to create a, a new event which wasn't like Barcamp UK GovWeb, which was using a, a hack day. A hack day was was created by Yahoo. They have huge public uh, huge data sets, and they wanted to encourage developers to come along and do stuff with that. Um, and so they they run those days. Um, and they're quite successful. They get like hundreds of people there, and they spend like 24, 48 hours and just give them the data sets and say, right, go and start making stuff. Um, so that's good. Oh, sorry, the laptop's completely the laptop's broken down. Completely broken. Um, I don't have it on here because it's a key, but do you that's have it on the internet? Because we hooked up. I don't have it on the internet. It's all right, it's all right. I'll Hold just on. continue trying to remember. Um, so we got all, you know, I, I wanted to create something similar to that. Um, and so we put out this, um, this kind of like provocative invite out there, which just basically said, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, um, government isn't very good at computers. We just, you know, kind of put that out there and said, we think we can do better, come along and we'll show them how it's done. Um, and we just put that out there, that was all we did, and we ended up with um, 80, or so, um, 80 or so people turning up. They had 10 hours to make stuff, um, and they made 29 projects, I think, overall. Real projects, they were there, they were on online, people could play around with them. Um, 
one of my favorite examples was um, there was a web website called activeplaces.com. Um, I think it costs like 5.3 million pounds. I don't know if someone in government could tell me, but I think it costs like 5.3 million pounds. It's the worst website I've, I've ever seen. I mean, it's just they, they really went out of their way to make it bad. Um, and we had uh, we had a guy, uh, four four people, spent 10 hours, and they they scraped all the data out of that website. So they didn't have data.gov.uk wasn't around then. They didn't have any like sources of data to get there. They just created a, a script that went through that website, very badly written website, um, got around all of the bad code and pulled out just the raw data. Um, hey. If you, uh, yes, and so they just pulled out that, that raw data and made a completely new one. That one. Uh, There we go. Uh, so that that's Barcamp UK Gov Web. That's a hacker. So this 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 is this is the web. This is uh, this is what um, activeplaces.com look, looks like. Uh, that's 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 all the all the spaces in London that you can go to 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 do your active stuff. Um, uh, and so what our message was like, don't, don't spend millions of pounds building stuff like this. Just give us the raw data, and we'll, we'll build our tools for ourselves. I mean, like, and it, there are a lot of people that can do that, and there are a lot of people that will do that. I mean, they just want to do it. I mean, we've, we've also run another event after that. Just, uh, this was the invite that we put out. There you go. Government isn't very good at computers. They spend millions on mediocre websites, hide away really useful public information, which is wrong, which is a shame. Um, calling all people that make things. So we did that. Um, uh, to make this happen, we had to kind of very quickly create our own little data.gov.uk um, because that didn't exist at the time. And that was just lots of screen scrape data and a few bits of data that we'd been given by departments thus far, but um, there wasn't a huge amount. Uh, how did that? Then we had like 29 projects that came out of it. This, this was our remade Active Places Reloaded, which was, you know, they did it in 10 hours, so it's just like a Google map. You can zoom in, you can click on them. You had a mobile, we had an iPhone app by the end of the day as well, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, so we had all these projects. You can go and look, at, you can look at the list of projects at rewisestate.org slash projects. We have since done um, Many more. We've done Young, Re Re Young Rewired State, which was for 15 to 18 year olds. Um, and we said, what do you want to build? And instead of, instead of us saying, instead of government getting lots of civil servants to try and build websites for young people, we just said, give us the data. We'll give that data to a load of 15 to 18 year olds and they'll build their own services. And what was really interesting out of that was they built things that they wanted, and you could then see what they actually wanted. So there was quite a few hacks which were based around safe routes home from their, from their home. And that, that was something that wasn't really being built. And um, they built it because clearly they wanted it. So they're like, how, how do we get home safely? Uh, we also did one for Justice and Home Affairs, .gov Labs, which is a collaboration between the three super sites. Um, what are the three super sites? DirectGov, NHS, and Business Link. They're very super. They're very super. Yeah. Um, we did National Government Day again this year, and we've done one for, for culture. So we've had a lot of projects come out of there. I don't actually know the number, but you can see them all there. Um, and that's kind of it, I think. In terms of, yeah, how we get the data is the crucial bit here, which is we just get it however we need, however, you know, however we can. Sometimes we go by the model of ask forgiveness, not permission. Um, you know, we'll just get data that we may not technically be allowed to have, but um, someone would look quite a fool stopping us from making, you know, using this data for a public good. Um, so there you go. I think that's it. Okay. So, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, let's see, 
I'm also on the board of directors for the Open Knowledge Foundation. So that's at okfn.org um, for those of you that are online. And if you don't know us, we're a UK-based uh, nonprofit foundation uh, with one simple goal. And that simple goal is to promote open knowledge. Now, how do we define what is open? Uh, well, we, we've set up a site called the Open Definition. It's at opendefinition.org, where we define what it means for something to be open knowledge. And um, it means essentially that the users have the right to use, reuse, and redistribute whatever that knowledge is, whether it's um, content, so pictures on Flickr, whether it's uh, software, or uh, in this case, what we're talking about today, data. And that's with very few restrictions. So that means commercial use is allowed. Um, that also means that um, things like attribution and share like or, or copyleft, uh, we consider to be okay. And so we do that across um, more or less everything. So we say genes to geodata, sonnets to st statistics. Um, one of the projects that we do, uh, so we do quite a few projects. We work in a really bottom-up, uh, user-led way. Uh, one of the projects that we have is called CCAN, uh, which Will mentioned. It's essentially a registry for open knowledge. And what that means is it, it's, it's just a tool to make stuff easier to find. Um, it's being used uh, by lots of sites these days. It's, it's open source code. Um, and it's used by data.gov.uk, for example, uh, among others. We've got projects like Open Shakespeare, which just takes all the works of the Bard and, and turns it into a, a knowledge package. So there's your, your sonnets. We've got um, a project called Where Does My Money Go, uh, which is at wheredoesmymoneygo.org. Uh, it's a winner of the Show Us a Better Way competition, and essentially it just takes UK public sector data, so um, around um, spending, and, and does a lot of really neat visualizations behind it, so that it, it's really accessible to see what central government is spending money on. There's also the project that I founded um, that I work on a lot, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about. Um, today about called the Open Data Commons, this opendatacommons.org. And what we do uh, is we make legal tools for open data. So the really simple way to think about it is in terms of we just turn the, the stop of uh, IP law into a go. Um, and we do that through providing a set of really easy to use legal tools um, that are in plain language and that are uh, openly and publicly available for people to use. So it's, if you're familiar with Creative Commons or the Free Software Foundation, um, we do more or less the same thing from a licensing perspective, but we focus really narrowly on data and databases. So first, what's the stop? What's the stop of um, IP law in particular? Um, the first one is copyright, right? So databases, Despite um, what some people like say or think about them, copyright law can be an issue uh, with, with, with databases. I won't go into all the specifics and, and, and bore you with all the details, um, but the end result is that um, copyright can be a problem for you if you have, have, a, have a database, or it can be an issue, a legal right that's covered. The second, here in Europe, we've got the database right. So we have a specific uh, EU-wide legislation that covers databases. There are other IP rights that, that can be involved, uh, such as contract, um, patents, trademarks, all sorts of things. Um, all of this, all these legal rights, basically create the problem where you have a Situation, so if you come up on some data on the internet on a, on a, a public website, um, just something that somebody's released on their own website, that this may be data that they themselves have got, you, have, you only really have four options, right? So if you see some, some data that's out there or any kind of knowledge, any kind of content that you want to use, you have four options. And option one is you ask for a license. So this is from a legal perspective, right? So you go and you get permission from them. A license is just the name for essentially like the contract that, that you have that says it's okay for you to use this. Two, um, you can um, use under an exception to 
these IP rights. So copyright, for example, is an absolute, like it doesn't cover absolutely everything that you want to do with it. There's exceptions. In the UK, we call them fair dealing. You may have heard of fair use. That's, that's sort of the US term for it. Um, and so that's the second. The third is uh, you can infringe. So this is um, the ask forgiveness and not permission model, um, where you, you just say, I, I don't really care. I'll take on the risk and just use it anyway. Um, the fourth is that you use something else, right? So you have these four options. So you can ask for a license. You can uh, decide what, that you're using it under an exception to IP law. And so don't need a license. You can um, infringe or uh, you can find an alternative. And, and this situation more or less means um, four things from a user perspective that sees some data out there, right? So it, it means lawyers. Um, which also, of course, means money. Uh, if you're in um, a business or if you're in a government and you want to use um, data from another part of government, it may mean paperwork. Uh, and most of all, it means time, right? It means time to having to figure out what the uh, licensing issues are, what your permission levels is, how, how you're going to approach this problem. Um, and so what open licenses do in, in general and what we try to do in, is open data comments is really simple equation. We just try to lower all four of those elements for um, both users and producers of data. So we do that through an, uh, an open license. This is often called a some rights reserved approach. So if you think of the sort of standard copyright, you know, 2010, um, Jordan Hatcher, all rights reserved, that's the default setting, right? So, so um, Open licenses are often called some rights reserved because they flip that default through having essentially a document that gives permission up front. So out of those four options, this is option one. This is, this is giving people permission. But instead of they having to come and ask you for permission, you give it to them um, up front really clearly, really cleanly on, say, your website. Now, um, the open definition that I mentioned, so being able to use, reuse, redistribute, it's essentially a um, legal standard, right? So um, because copyright, because database rights set this default um, that you couldn't use, reuse, or redistribute without permission, for something to be open, um, it has to meet uh, a certain legal standard in those regards. So when I talk about open data and just what open data is, all, all it really is, um, from my perspective, is taking a lot of the um, same principles and um, policies that are present in open source and um, open content, so Creative Commons, that sort of thing, and just applying it to data and databases. So you, you're just kind of extending it um, just that little bit. In terms of the tools that we have um, to date produced, we've produced three main tools. Uh, the first is called the, the Public Domain Dedication and License. The second is the, uh, the PDDL. The second is the Attribution Database License. And the third is um, uh, the Open Database License. So I'm going to talk a little bit about all three of them. And I'll, I'll start with the Open Database License. So this is a, it's a share-like license. It's much like, if you're familiar with Creative Commons, it's much like CC by SA. Um, it means that if you use the data, that you have to give credit. So that's the first thing. That's an, it's an attribution share-like license. And that you have to give credit to the data producer that you got it from. It also means that if you take, and take the data in the database, um, make some additions to it, change it around, add your own data, that that end result, so your stuff plus the database that you got, has to be under that same license, has to stay under the open database license. So this license in particular is um, going to be adopted by OpenStreetMap. I don't know if you know OpenStreetMap, but they uh, essentially are like a Wikipedia, but for mapping and geodata. So they do, um, it's a massive uh, online collaboration around um, just, just mapping sort of everything. Uh, you, sh you should definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. They've got uh, much more detail than, than Google Maps, for example. Um, 
so, so that's the open database license, right? Uh, the second one is the attribution database license. So, th so that one is essentially the same as the first one, but without this, the share-like provision. So the only real thing that you have to do when you um, take data that is under this license is, is give credit back to the person that you got it from. The third is our most uh, liberal uh, legal tool. It's called the Public Domain Dedication and License. I, I'm not very creative with my license names. Um, the PDDL does, it does what it says on the 10, right? So it, 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 all, it strips out all copyright, database rights, and contract issues so that you can do whatever you want with the license. Um, it's much like uh, being a fan of, of well, being a, a big nerd over legal stuff and licensing. It's much like there's, there's this license that's called the do what the fuck you want to license. It's, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, right? So you can take that as a lesson that you can do whatever you want with the data and database because there are no IP rights to stop you from it. Creative Commons has a specific tool that they also use for data and databases that they recommend. It's CC0. Uh, it is also a public domain uh, legal tool, and so if stuff's under CC0 and under the PDDL, you can totally intermix it uh, and play around with it and mix it with even proprietary data. In terms of um, some closing thoughts, just on some of the practicalities of things, um, because because we kind of have this theme around around cities and government data. Um, I think that the core thing to think about when choosing a license and an approach to this is, is, is the reasons why you're opening things up. And I think that from a city perspective, uh, a government perspective in general, you, you're opening up your data for reasons such as you, you wanna increase transparency and accountability, um, de reasons around democracy. You may even want to be encouraging innovation, right? So um, this is just the idea of increasing the tax base by, um, uh, increasing the amount of people building businesses with stuff that you produce. And to really meet all those goals, um, I think that you want the most liberal license possible. And so actually the public domain is a really good approach because it allows the most flexibility for your users, including um, for things like, like building a business out of it, right? Uh, which, which can be hugely important as you sort of scale up with what people want to do with data um, that government produces. Uh, a sort of a, a final closing thought, I, I realize that there's sort of a hurdle that can be there at times to uh, internally within government um, to, to take that leap to using a license at times. And so maybe as a low hanging fruit uh, is from a legal perspective, changing the terms and conditions uh, across, or maybe legislating that they had to be changed uh, across government websites that, that facilitates screen scraping, right? So it facilitates the work that, that the people with Rewired State do and say, look, we don't care if you scrape our sites. Um, here's explicit permission, please scrape our sites, um, and that the data that you produce out of that um, by scraping our sites is, is public domain. It's yours to keep and, and do what you want with it. Um, so that's more or less me done without slides. Thank so. you. Thanks. Well, I'll hand over to Ema then, who's going to tell us about London Data Storm. Perhaps you just introduce yourself a little bit first. Sure. Okay, so I'm Ema Coleman, and uh, I'm uh, working in the Greater London Authority at the moment. I'm on secondment from Barna Council, where I'm Assistant Chief Executive. Um, and so my major project in the GLA for the last uh, eight months has been, uh, you know, working behind the London Data Store and trying to free all of London's public sector data. Um, so what I'd just like to say at the outset is, because I know Manchester has ambitions to, to release all of its data, is that I, it's my opinion that it's not just about releasing data or indeed using new technologies, for example, in, in uh, local government, um, but it's about a kind of fundamental shift in the paradigm of governance. So I'm just going to go through my presentation now. Thankfully, I've stopped hyperventilating and it won't work. Um, and this is just a bit about my working day. Um, this should have the soundtrack to Mission Impossible, but clearly we don't have any sound. <laughs> so 
These are all our functional bodies, police, TfL, London Development Agency. I haven't started on the London boroughs yet, but I'm just about to set my uh, sights on them. And that's just one nut. <laughs> okay, so, so I guess you've got to ask, well, what's the problem, really? Why are people so resistant to giving out data? Why are public uh, agencies so resistant? Um, and so what we've tried to do is, is, is map it, really, in terms of, you know, what kind of system of governance do we have uh, in the UK and, indeed, across the world? So if you look at the middle, middle column here, um, this is really... Oh, sorry. If you look at the middle column here, really, this is the system of public management we've had in the UK and across the world for the last 20 years. So it's called NPM, or New Public Management. So you would recognize it by a kind of a market-driven perspective, setting targets, very rational approach to policy making. In other words, we gather the evidence, we decide what we want as a solution, and uh, we pull the lever and it happens. So for example, you could look at an approach to obesity or waste minimization. People don't really work like that. You can't really have that rational approach. Um, so we want to have, you know, strategic action. That's what we take. So we want to force people to do things. We want to force them to change their behavior. That's not really how it works. Uh, and in terms of data, we want to contextualize it. You know, government wants to tell you what this data set means. But actually, you want to figure that out for yourself or you want to come to a different conclusion. So my argument would be the release of data is actually about shifting a whole paradigm of governance over to this side. And ironically, we might have seen a bit of this, although we don't know how it's going to work out, with the Clegg and Cameron kind of negotiations that have been going on. A bit more communication, a bit more collaboration, a bit more shifting, dialogue, etc. As I say, who knows how that's going to work out, but it might properly be in this right-hand side column. So, so my argument is it's not just about releasing data, but it's about a fundamental culture change. So just ticking boxes isn't going to do it anymore. I don't know how many people here are fans of The Wire, but if you look at um, this character here, Bubs, who's a, a drug addict, for example, his problems are not amenable to state action in the way that we think they are, okay? Um, and so what we, I would argue is we need a fundamental culture change that's absolutely huge. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the problem of ownership. It's mine, right? And my experience um, approaching this in the London data store would be, obviously, the structure of the GLA. We have the GLA, and we have our four functional bodies underneath. And even within those organizations, there are people who hold data, and they're separate. It's not like this linear idea that you can just give an instruction and say, give me your data. There's all sorts of people hidden away who have all sorts of data who think it's theirs. So one of the learning experiences we've had is that we need to shift people away from this idea that they are are data owners to the fact that they're custodians of it. You know, they might manage it, they might look after it, but they don't own it. Um, and so you have this issue around monetization as well, this feeling that, public, uh, that the public sector can uh, monetize this asset in some way, although they show spectacularly, you know, that they haven't, really. And our argument would be, no, we don't need to monetize it, we need to put it out there so that clever people like James can do stuff with it, and, and that's what we need to do. Um, and again, this issue which keeps coming up over the last eight months, you know, I talk to people and say, just put it out there. They're going, what if it's wrong? What if it's wrong? And I'm going, well, if it's wrong, somebody will tell us, and then we'll fix it, and that would be a good thing. But it's a huge, you know, culture shift, again, to put something out that might be incorrect, because, of course, it's always going to be incorrect, because, you know, human error is involved. If you're going over a spreadsheet for a couple of hours, you're going to make a mistake, so there's every chance that's going to happen in government data. Um, and I can tell you, as a public servant, um, you know, you don't get rewarded for failure, okay? Um, you know, your career path is going to end pretty quickly if you, you know, mess it up. So there is a huge culture within the public sector of being risk-averse, and obviously politically being risk-averse. Uh, and just putting stuff out there is a huge threat, um, and, I, and I wouldn't underestimate that. So, you, you know, you, you need to be aware of that and see, can you find ways of sort of getting around that maybe. Um, the other factor is the huge kind of spin element, the communications element. You know, you put stuff out there. Um, for example, we're going to be shortly releasing into the data store from TFL information which came through under an, um, an assembly question to the mayor on SPAD data, which is signals passed at danger uh, for the tube. Now, you know, the comms people are not happy because the media, uh, in, the, in the way that it currently works, is going to make a big deal out of that and say, oh, you're living on the most dangerous tube line in London, etc. Um, and they're the concerns people have, is, you know, if you put it out there, 
you know, what are, the, what are the media going to do about it? And I would argue we need probably to have a different dialogue with the media and we need to, you know, um, be a bit more mature, I guess. Um, the photograph on the left is uh, one of the first workshops that we had around the London Data Store when we did an open call to developers in London. Uh, you see Chris Taggart's back there, and that's Brian Hodley. And 60 of them came in and spent three hours with us in City Hall, and we basically said, what should we do, what shouldn't we do? Um, and they work at quite a pace compared to the public sector. Um, I just photoshopped myself in there because... Um, but, but I am one of them, you know, and there's another dilemma there as well. So I'm trying to be a, a kind of protagonist and try and push people to do something I want. But I'm also trying to be collegiate in what I do. So, you know, I can get annoyed at TfL and the LDA and the Met, but, but I am also a public servant and I need to be cognizant of that. So it's how do you marry those two worlds? And the kind of message I'm giving um, to the functional bodies and to the boroughs is this is a really good example um, of the difference between how slow public servants work and how quickly the development world works. So I ring up TfL and I say, mm, cycle hire schemes coming up. I'd really like to get the locations of the data and put it in the data store. Um, and then I'd like the real-time data so that developers can build something that would tell you where the next, you know, how many bikes are left at the next cycle hire scheme. And TfL say, great. And then they say, well, you need to talk to Circo because we're working with Circo on this. And I go, great. And they go, well, we set up a meeting here between Circo and TfL and you. And I went, great. Two weeks later, get a little tweet in saying, come and see the cycle hire app that I've built. And so this is Alex, um, who had put in an FOI request. And he'd gotten all that information. So here's one arm of the state requesting it in a collegiate way from TfL. And Alex already got it under an FOI. And he'd already built the app. Now, the point is TfL wanted to have a competition with developers, right, um, to launch the cycle hire scheme. So I rang them up and I said, it's over. It's too late. It's already built, right? So it's a really good example, I think, of how we need to, you know, the public sector needs to understand how quickly these things happen. So I called this guy up and I said, okay, we'd like you to build in a social networking element into this app. So could we see if we could check in on, on Foursquare or what could we do? So, you know, I think the message got through that, you know, you either move fast or you're overtaken. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say about it is, um, and it's really a tribute to the um, developers that we've been working with in the London Data Store since last October. I mean, they have given us a fantastic amount of support and advice, and I can call them up and say, all right, I'm getting stonewalled here. What should I, you know, what argument should I use to get back? And when we launched uh, the new London.gov, uh, which was our, our sort of new look website, one of the things we did was we set up a Flickr group and we said, um, if Londoners want to put their photographs of London in here, we'll use them on the website. And within a day of launching that group, five professional photographers put in photographs of the mayor with his head on a pig and started saying, you're trying to ruin our livelihood, you know. And then they uh, spoke to Katie Day, who's a journalist in The Telegraph, who blogs on photography. And Katie did a, a blog which said we were, we were trying to do what the government had done, which was go out and take a photograph of how Britain has improved under new labor. And she was suggesting that we were doing the same thing. And it was a complete distortion of what we were trying to achieve. And a number of the developers, who were obviously quite creative as well, also photographers, called me up and said, you want to be aware of this, Emer? You know, this is trending a bit, and there's a lot of discussion on Twitter. And I got really annoyed, and I thought, you know, Really, we're trying to do a good thing here. This is a bit about crowdsourcing. It's a bit about, you know, profiling people's creativity. Um, and then they started having that discussion on our behalf, I guess. Uh, they started posting photographs, um, you know, posting links to Katie's blog. But it wasn't the state doing that. It was people who trusted us because we've been working together for the last eight months saying, I can see your point. So I think that's really... Um, important issue around the sharing of data is those kind of engagements that you have so the state can reach out and other people can reach into us. And so now we have, you know, 111 members and lots of really beautiful photographs. And the, we never took the photographs down of the mayor with his head and a pig, so you can go and have a look at that if you wish. Um, but the point is, it was, we couldn't drum up that engagement when we needed it. It was because we'd had all that sort of engagement through the developer community, and I think that's great. And so what I'm, what I'm talking about is my vision of governance is really a, about a network system where we are all working together in our different roles. Um, and that's just a little joke, really. Um, but all the people who are, you see, you know, some of them are inside government, some are outside government, that a lot of people have become interconnected through the London Data Store, sometimes in a really challenging way. You know, it hasn't, it's, it's been really difficult. Um, 
Uh, but this is where we need to get to. So my core point is, this is not just about data sets. What you're asking, if you're asking Manchester City Council to do, is no less than a radical sort of reprovision of a model of governance. It isn't just about give me a couple of Excel spreadsheets. It's asking them to change fundamentally the core of what they do. And, you know, that's a big ask. So that's me done. My name is Jane Clift. I'm from the British Museum. My question is for Jordan. Um, we, uh, we have already published all of our collections data online, but not in a way that it can be readily shared by anybody else. And we are actively working to publish all of our collections data online. It's a very rich, complex data set. Two million um, uh, de collections records and about, I don't know, 600,000 images, something like that. Um, and the museum's executive is backing this. But they are a little concerned around licensing. They don't want to kind of make it a, a free-for-all right from the start. I was wondering if you got a suggestion for a model that might work for them, so they have some control for a period of time. Well, um, so I, I guess there's a few parts in that. I, I, I know that it's really hard for, at times for, for governments to go for a full, or, or public sector bodies to go for a full public domain approach. Because um, it, politically, it, it can be a tougher sell to totally give up your, your rights. And even though I, I, I think it is probably the, the preferable approach, um, what the British Museum could, could follow is, is the line of um, data.gov.uk, which is an attribution-only license, right? So, uh, and that's also incidentally, you know, last week, week before last, uh, the World Bank released uh, lots and lots of, of, of development data, and, th and they did it under an attribution license. And I, I think that there's a lot of precedent, both within the UK and among other sort of public bodies, um, for using that type of approach. Uh, you know, in the end, it comes down to what are you going to do with it, um, and, and, and what are the real risks. And I, I think a lot of the risks that institutions see um, for releasing their stuff, uh, and when they get down to it, they just really aren't much of a risk at all. Um, yes, my name is Igor Goldkamp. My name is Igor I'm from Oxford Semantics. And uh, I'm interested in, um, as I'm sure many people are, as to your impressions of the recent change in government and how it will affect the linked data initiative, the, especially the 30 million pound um, stipend that was allocated by, from, as you put, one, from one geek to another. And uh, if you feel that the Tory manifesto, uh, uh, which I've just read this morning, um, is going to um, affect that funding or the programs that a lot of you are in effect, uh, standing on top of or holding up. I was always quite surprised when I was inside government that uh, a race started between the government and the then opposition party um, as to who could say the most interesting geeky things about open data. Uh, it was quite odd to see David Cameron two years ago making speeches where he promised to legislate as an early priority to make councils release their data. That was very odd um, for me as a civil servant. I didn't think that would ever happen. Um, and now they're in power, um, and I think they have, you know, my, my understanding from talking to people around the fringes is very much that this, um, the data, tran the transparency, which is, you know, the political goal they want is transparency of contracts, transparency of government, um, a, a re-empowering of democracy at a grassroots level, that they understand that open data is a fundamental part of that. So um, I don't see that there'll be any diminution. Now on funding um, and the money that was allocated to the Institute of Shadbolt and all the rest of it, who's speaking later, I think, maybe you should ask him. Um, I don't know. Uh, we're in a, you know, hell, we're in a tough public spending environment. Um, and uh, I wouldn't, I don't think anybody in the public sector is counting their chickens um, on that right now. We have an emergency budget within 50 days. Um, I just don't know. Uh, but I think the sentiment is there. And a lot of stuff on public data can be done uh, at almost zero cost, relative to everything else. The specific thing on semantics is rather different, and I, I don't really know what their policies, are, what policies might be in that area. I, I suppose one of the questions, if you phrase it very well, is really about the interpretation of policy. What do you think the 
Oh, I, I think this is a. It'll, I think we'll hopefully st we'll see a steadily increasing drive for transparency and open data, I, uh, and I think that's a good thing, one way or another. Um, I think the the prior government would have carried on doing that as well, and this government seems to be equally committed to it, if not more so, as far as I can make out. But let's judge actions, uh, not words, and that will come that will become apparent over the next six months, I guess. Okay. Any other questions, uh, gentlemen? Tim Davies, currently researching uh, open government data at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, and just interested in Emma's slide, uh, last line of the, the cultural change models from new public management of contextualised data to community of government of raw data, um, which I think is a trend we're seeing, but it's, it's, it's why that trend? Why, what, what do we lose when we lose contextualised data or when data is contextualised by many different people in many different places? Because certainly one thing I've started to hear from people is we're seeing the same information on many different sites. We're not sure what's up to date or which is authoritative or not. Are, are there risks there for us? Yes, of course. Absolutely there are risks. But I think what we want to get... I mean, you know, it's two opposite ends of the spectrum, isn't it? So saying, on one hand, government is trying to continue, you know, always contextualise data, tell you what this means, and the other end, it's a free-for-all. And I would argue that somewhere in the middle, we will come to some consensus about what does it mean. But I think what I would love to see is for more people to have the opportunity to say, well, actually, it's not just about five public servants sitting in a room deciding what this means. It's a bit about, what does it mean, actually? You know, other people can take different things from it. So, so there are risks, but I would hope that the, my whole point is that government has to come to a place where it says, yeah, OK, all right, maybe we didn't call that right. What do you think? How could we mend it? Or is there a different way of looking at it? So it's about a much more communicative, discursive form of governance that isn't defensive about the fact that, you know, somebody might take a different reading from the data because, you know, there's a million ways to, to look at a, a problem. Why should the state have the monopoly on the right answer? I would often be confronted with a similar variant of that argument in central government, and I always thought it was the most ludicrous argument in the world for not releasing data. Um, and I would always point civil servants to the House of Commons and see how MPs interpret, on both sides of the House, interpret exactly the same piece of data that's been fussed to death by the National Statistics Authority over ages, and one side of the House will say, it's the end of the world, and the other side of the House will say, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and that's at the very heart of politics. I think it's a nonsense argument for not releasing data. There are some, you know, and, and then if you take it down into its, into right into the detail and say, yes, but at a statistical level, we need to relate it to another data set. We can't take it out of context. Well, if you understand that much about statistics, you shouldn't be doing it anyway. Do you see what I mean? So it's, I think it's a nonsense argument. Any, any more questions from the floor for the panelists? No? Okay. Well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all our panellists for uh, their contributions today. The debate uh, around open data is going to continue, as I say, throughout the day. The next panel debate that will go on will look a bit more at the sort of um, philosophies and ethics surrounding the issue. We've, we've done quite, you know, a lot of detail here about different case studies and approaches and, and some tools which hopefully you take away. And just to pick up on Coral's point, yeah. Um, the Manchester Open Data project, uh, you know, is in its infancy, as it were. And uh, I know Julian Tate, who's Julian L. Star on um, Twitter, uh, or myself, I'm at Foodie Sarah on Twitter, would be very happy to hear from anybody who wants to sort of develop that conversation around Manchester data going forward. But for now, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you.